conversation without any further ado, ado my very good friend, Mr. Dickie Bears, stuntman extraordinaire, storyteller. And also from Return of the Jedi, Mr. Kevin Thompson. Wedge and Tilly voice, David Acord. Very nice guy. I had dinner with him a couple nights ago. And Dak himself, Mr. Anna Boba, Vespin Boba Fett, Mr. John Morton. And the guy who, Luke Skywalker didn't do it, the guy who really blew up the Death Star, Mr. Thane Morris. And one of my favorite son men ever, Mr. Julius LaFleur. He doesn't like me. He doesn't. All right, so we're going to have to, this is the largest panel of the weekend. So we're going to have, some of you got a mic? Who's got a mic? You, go, so, you take the mic from zero to m minus and just put it on, because I'm sure they didn't turn it on. They haven't done it all. They haven't done it all weekend. Here, this is for you, Mr. LaFleur. Okay, we all good? Everybody got a mic on? We go, oh my God, oh my God, Margo was also supposed to, come on out, Margo. That's why we have, I was wondering why they gave me another chair. Yeah. Margo, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm blaming that on Tucky. He was in your way. I'm so sorry. He did that on purpose. So We've worked on projects before. I'm so sorry. I didn't do that. How you guys, how you guys all doing? Good. Original Good. trilogy, yeah. original trilogy. Yeah. The best part of Star Wars, we know that, right? Yeah. The best part was the, it was absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So everybody's doing good today. You guys all having a good time here in Dallas? Barbecue with uh, stormtroopers. Any stormtroopers out there, love to invite you over. You know, we got barbecue sauce and all sorts of hickory. We got a hickory smoke and stuff like that. So if there's any stormtroopers out there, love to have you over for a barbecue. That's in canon. Hey. They actually, the, the Ewoks actually ate some of those people, the, human, the, the rebels in the, in the books. To, the rebel had pilots had to stop them. Yes, we had to clear the forest. And people, <laughs> all, all these rebel guys coming over going, wow, what is that? It tastes so familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well, it might be a good idea because there's so many, God, this, this might be the biggest panel I've ever done. Why don't we start with John and, and pass the mic around. Why don't we say just a brief little, who are you and why are you on my stage? Yeah, I was in Empire Strikes Back. I'm John Morton. I played Dak Ralter, who was Luke Skywalker's tail gunner, and I did two days for Jeremy Bullock as Boba Fett, saying, he's no good to me, dead. You also had a great line as Dak, and you say he has one of the best lines in the movie, I think. Uh, right now, I feel like I can take on the whole panel all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Mr. Beers. What do you want to know? Uh, uh, what did you do for the uh, original trilogy? That's what we're going to talk about. Why, why? This is the original trilogy stage, the best part of all of Star Wars, the best three movies ever made. And what was your contribution? I was five different characters. One of them was Boba Fett. The other one was Gamorrean Guard. The other one was uh, Barada, a biker scout, rebel, so a rebel soldier, and a stormtrooper. And I doubled for um, Luke Skywalker. See, that's why I didn't know that. What part? The, uh, when he was fighting? In the well, what happened was, uh, as you know, and you, you will find out, that uh, a lot of the stunt guys got hurt on the Sarlacc pit. And uh, one of the guys that got hurt was the stunt double, the, the real stunt double, for, or the, the, the original stunt double for Luke Skywalker. So I had to take over from him, and that guy was, uh, his name is Colin Skeeping. And uh, Colin is a really, like, athletic guy, you know, tumbler, and you can walk on his hands and all that kind of stuff. I'm not like that. So um, I did a few things, but, and it doesn't look, didn't look as good as they wanted it to look, but I was okay. I got away with it, you know. <laughs> they used it on film, so must have been okay. <laughs> Okay, well done you. Kevin, so this is like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. You just say your name and, and, what, and what you did. But not for alcohol, just for Star Wars. Hi, my name's Kevin Thompson. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it like that. And I'm an alcoholic Ewok. <laughs> <laughs> Who loves barbecue. Who loves barbecue, yes. I played uh, 20 different Ewoks, and I'm in 38 different scenes in the battle. And so... Uh, I was basically all the Ewoks. It was like, follow me, boys. <laughs> yeah, I take out all three ATSTs. 
I could do uh, every single uh, rope swing. I uh, probably kill about 40 different uh, stormtroopers. So, yes, all those people, all those people who sit there and say, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to the, to the rebels? How are we going to get out of this? And then some flight Ewok comes flying in, taking out two stormtroopers. That was me taking out Dickie. <laughs> Dickie, were you at all killed by an Ewok in Return of the Jedi? Do you recall? Sorry? Were you killed by an Ewok during uh, Return of the Jedi? Do you recall? By more than one. By more than oh, one. all right. So he killed you more than once he, or twice. More, yes, yes. More than one. Like what actually happened was um, as soon as you were knocked out by one of the Ewoks, they would replace you with a dummy and then they put you in another spot and get killed again. You know, like <laughs> that, that's, that's, how, that's how it went. But I was actually lucky because what happened was uh, we were doing that scene, but the day before, uh, Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford, and a couple of the stunt guys, and myself, we had a party. And um, we were not quite sober when we came to no, work in the morning. Those so guys. we were a little bit hungover. You were with Carrie. And, um, yeah. You were with Carrie. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, cut a long story short, I was knocked out and by one of the Ewoks, and I think it, it, it was this one, actually. And um, I ended up on the floor, and I fell asleep. <laughs> and then in, in the Stormtrooper outfit. And then um, Carrie realized that I fell asleep, and she talked to uh, Lucas and the director, um, um, forgot his name now. Richard, Richard Mark, 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 Mark Yeah, uh, f told them to work around me, leave me on the floor, leave me asleep because she knew I was still hungover from the night before. And um, anyway, the, the other stunt guys had to just keep on working and they were really not happy with me laying there sleeping, you know? So filming went on all day and I'm still on the floor sleeping and then they rapped and they left me. <laughs> they, they didn't wake me up. So everything, everybody's gone and I'm still asleep and then night started falling in the forest and it was getting really cold and that's when I woke up. Now it's dark and there's animals around it and everything and I went like, what the heck? So I went to my trailer to the, uh, the porter cabin to get my costume off, my, my armorer off and uh, to put my own clothes on but they locked it and they took the key. <laughs> so I couldn't get in there. So here I am, in, it's getting darker and darker and I go, like, what am I going to do now? So I took all the armor off, and underneath it, we had black leotards, like completely black uh, costume underneath it. So I took all the armor off and uh, went back to the road. But there was one thing, the helmet, they were really like, you know, the helmet was the one thing, you couldn't get it hurt, you couldn't, couldn't lose it, couldn't break it, whatever. And so I thought, like, I'm not going to leave that under the porter cabin, I'm gonna take that with me. So I'm walking down the forest in my white boots, black outfit, and a, and a stormtrooper helmet under, under my arm. About half an, hour, half an hour to 45 minutes walk to the main road, and then I started to try and um, hitchhike back to the hotel. <laughs> so It's 45 minutes to so the hotel. Yeah, true. That, and so here I am standing there trying to get a lift and every car that came towards me so it started coming towards me in a straight line and then it made a really wide turn around me and just kept on going so I went like that's not going to work <laughs> because what they were seeing was like an idiot in a in a in a black suit with white boots and, and a white helmet under under his arm so I started walking back to the hotel and then um I put my finger up, my thumb up every time a car came by and then finally one car stopped and it turned out to be the receptionist in the hotel who knew me and okay. she stopped <laughs> and took me back to the hotel. So that was my uh, experience with uh, getting knocked out by the uh, Ewoks. Those, those darn Ewoks. <laughs> All right, uh, well, we're going to get to you, Margo. Uh, uh, David, it's your turn, and try to make it so your answer somehow meshes into the fact that Dickie can answer it for you. See if you can do that. Hey, Dickie, Dickie, could you answer it for me? Uh, what? Well, who am I? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, 
Yeah, so I'm David Ankrum, and I was the voice of Wedge Antilles in A New Hope and in Rogue One. And uh, as a PA announcer, because uh, I don't believe Dennis was available for it, so um, I, I, I was lucky enough 40 years later to, to, to go out to Disney Studios and, and lay down that voice. So, And that's kind of, you know, my experience with Star Wars is just those two, the voice of Wedge in, in two films. It's a big character, yeah. It's so um, it's great to be here. I, I, I love hearing these stories. I mean, it's fantastic. So uh, I will, you know, talk more, but that's my intro. <laughs> okay, now we'll get back. You know, we'll get to and I am an alcoholic. <laughs> no, I'm a <laughs> voice actor. Okay. Dane, I'm how you Dane doing? Dane Morris. Uh, I worked on... Uh, Empire and Return of the Jedi. My job was at ILM. Um, if it blew up, I had to blow it up. <laughs> uh, in California, you have to have a license to blow things up. I have the license, so. Empire was fairly easy. Return of the Jedi, uh, I had a stack of storyboards about that high that uh, I was fairly busy for about four months in a room that they had put me into because I'm kind of a messy guy and uh, I'm noisy and I smell bad. <laughs> can you can you give us an anecdote about about blowing up a Death Star or Jabba's? You you also blew up Jabba's uh, sail barge, if I'm correct, right? Yeah. Could you give it among a, a lot of other things? Yeah, I blew up the Death Star. That's pretty easy. It was a pretty simple thing. It's a, you know, thing you get big around, and they want it to go away, and they want it to go away fairly quickly. <laughs> and uh, so you put the right chemicals in it and uh, about three little bombs so that you can get it to open up and then make a big fireball. And uh, that thing was, you know, that's easy. Uh, the barge was about four feet long, uh, and it started at the back end and went through the thing. So with that one, we had to get the high-speed camera out, which is 360 <coughs> frames a second, 12 times speed. And uh, I had built a timer that I could go down to 0 .001 seconds with, at 360, that's 0 .002 seconds per frame. So you say, okay, this goes on frame one, this goes on frame two, this goes on frame five, this goes on frame seven, so that it doesn't look planned. It just stutters through it. And uh, you get one shot at it. That's the nice thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> and. Uh, you get up there and you push the go switch and everything works and you go find the next thing you got to work on. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you, when you, for instance, when you blew up the Death Star, did you blow up that big working model they had throughout the movie and they just, it's the end of the film, now we can blow it up? Or was this a special model that was built just to be blown it up? A, it was an explosion model. Okay. Um, the big models like that were made out of flammable plastic and uh, you can't control flammable plastic very well. You set it on fire and you set the whole studio on fire. So we make stuff like that out of high temperature epoxy. Okay. Okay? And it's brittle. It makes it come apart easier. Okay. Excellent, thank you. I just, just wanted to know, good information. Yeah. Mr. LaFleur, how you doing? I'm doing fine. <laughs> I'm Julius LaFleur. Um, I worked on Return of the Jedi. Um, when I originally got hired to work on the show, I was there to double Lando Calrigian. And then um, once I got there, I was multiple characters, as Dickie was. I was like five different characters, and I found out since I got here, I was two additional that I didn't even know about. <laughs> but um, it was, a, at that particular time, I worked a lot in the industry. And that was one of the toughest shows I had ever worked on. Dickie was right, a lot of people got hurt. Uh, Dickie and I were multiple characters um, throughout the film, stormtroopers, biker scouts, 
Um, Kevin knocked me out, or somebody knocked me out. You don't want to. <laughs> Uh, but the, he said the, hit me, and so I did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the, the battle with the Ewoks was kind of real battles because what happened was they hired a couple, um, a couple stunt stunt uh, Ewoks that were paid regular pay. Yes. And then they brought a lot of other Ewoks there that were get based. They were hardly getting anything. Right. So they were pissed, <laughs> rightfully so. So when the battle sequences started, they kind of took it out on us. Am I right? Your production, production, production. <laughs> so a lot of those sequences were, you know, were uh, really authentic. And, and uh, we got uh, water balloons thrown at us at lunchtime. Oh, yeah. You remember? You were but you loved it. I, I got a kick out of it. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, a lot of people, I mean, we could talk about behind the scenes, but as far as a stunt person goes, uh, it, and, and what happened in the desert was something that nobody was really ready for because we're putting hoods on in like 120 degree temperature, and nobody wanted those freaking hoods on. And Dick, you didn't, you didn't want, I didn't want them on, and you had to, it was very uncomfortable. Well, as we, I, we thought we were doubling people, but we were actually those characters, which that's why we're on the stage right now. But it was um, a very ambitious shoot uh, with a small crew, um, technology. Uh, I know we will talk deeper about it, but you know, you have Luke Skywalker swinging the little thing that looked like a stick, a black stick, and it just everything looked stupid. It was imaginary <laughs> things that you were, you were fighting, and you know, this is new technology. You gotta know this has never been seen before, at least by us, you know. And you're fighting, it, it, there's those big chicken walker things, what are those things called? ATST. They're walking through the forest and, and we're running and dodging and getting shot by them. And it was just, um, it was, I was like, this is gonna be the corniest movie ever made. <laughs> and I'm, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna finish up real quick. No, no, take your time. But uh, when, we, when I got hired on the film, and, and Dickie probably tell you this, I keep mentioning Dickie because we went through so much together. They wouldn't tell us the name of the film. It was called Blue Harvest. Blue Harvest, yeah. And uh, they called me to, from Los Angeles to go to Yuma, Yuma, Arizona, and I'm thinking, this is Blue Harvest. This is kind of a stupid name for a movie. Is it a farmer movie or something? <laughs> well, you know, what's this movie going to be about? So I get there, and um, when I arrived there, it was given a party, I think, by the pool, a little, a little cocktail party. And I saw a lot of guys on crutches. I was like, shoot, am I going to be next? <laughs> and uh, and walking around, and I'm saying, God, that, that guy kind of looks like Harrison Ford. Then I said, well, it kind of looks like Carrie Fisher there. Wow, that looks like Billy D. Williams. I said, Hollywood has no originality. All these actors look like somebody else. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so later on, I mean, I'm looking. And I finally met Billy D. Williams, who's a big star, you know, African American community. Hey, I'm Billy D. Williams. I'm Julius LaFleur. Uh, so you're doubling me, right? And I said, yeah. How's it feel to work on Star Wars? Wait, this is Blue Harvest. <laughs> You've been drinking. <laughs> no, this is Star Wars. And then everything opened up, and it was it was huge. And and I got enthusiasm, I was excited, you know, to work on a, such an iconic film. So, anyway. Well, they, they, they called the movie uh, Blue Harvest because they wanted it to be not known that it was Star Wars, to number one. But the main reason was because of whatever reason, they were saving $3 million by changing the name into Blue Harvest. That was what I heard about it. But the fun part was like we were all given like Blue Harvest t-shirts, Blue Harvest caps, and, and uh, on the flight back, all the English guys that came back, we, all the, we were all on the same flight. And we were all told like this is Blue Harvest, nothing to do with Star Wars. So we enter America, we come into, I think we came into Phoenix, America, or some, somewhere around there. And we go through passport control and then they opened up some of our bags. And the first box that they opened, 
they opened it up, and what came out of it? Darth Vader's head. So then, <laughs> the guys, the, the the guys at the passport control, and 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 uh, you know the um, uh, customs. Uh, yeah, customs. They were saying, "Blue Harvest, what is this?" <laughs> <laughs> and so they knew what was going on. But you know that was the funny part about it. Like. It was all hush hush. You cannot say it's Star Wars, but everybody knew it was Star Wars. You know, it was especially the, the early parts where you're filming outside. They want to hide that because it's not behind the studio walls and stuff. This anybody can walk up in the in the woods or the desert and start filming. I would have. I was like nine, and I would have. I would have flown all the way there if I could have. But Margot, so what 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 did you do in Star Wars? What what was your part? I play. Is that on? I don't know. I play Tilcat the Ewok in Return of the Jedi. I, um, my main scenes were, I took the gun out of Harrison Ford's hand, um, when they did the log scene, I was shooting the bow and arrow, and we jumped like a bunch of chickens and ran, and, what else, oh, well, uh, after I took the gun away, we're bowing, you can see me going, oh, oh. <laughs> I went through the explosive scenes, but. Anthony Daniels loves that scene, that's his well, favorite scene in all of Star Wars, <laughs> that sound you guys are making, uh, uh you know. <laughs> yeah, um. Their but, time. Hmm? but you took the blaster from Harrison Ford. That's, That's a big right. deal. I mean, he's the biggest actor in the world at the time. That's and right. And you we disarmed did, him. We did that a Go several you. time. Yeah. Go you. That was fun, though. I didn't mind. What's, I just, this question is for anybody. Did anybody have a, um, a favorite part of Star Wars? Like it? It could be a scene you did. I was just going to. Oh, I'm sorry. You weren't done yet. You weren't done yet. Go ahead. No, that's okay. No, you know how they're talking about. Um, I can't remember what they're going to say. Oh, when we first were. When they told us to beat up on the stormtroopers, right? The uh, director goes, okay, guys, I want you to beat up on the stormtroopers, right? So we got our rubber clubs, and we were literally beating them up, and the guys were going, help, help, help. Look, on, look at the look on okay, your face. Okay, the, What happened was, as the fights continued for several weeks, the Ewoks kind of got slick. They started developing, like, WWF moves. <laughs> and we were doing okay for a second, but there's a, uh, Ewok would kind of get behind you low because our vis visibility wasn't, wasn't too good. And then one would run and tackle you and hit you in the chest, and you flip over backwards. And once you're on the ground, they beat the hell out of us. <laughs> so you, did, you were one of the Ewoks that was beating people as yeah. they were on the ground? Well, I, I remember that when we first did that, um, the guys were going, oh. And the director goes, okay, cut. He goes, don't really beat him up, pretend. We Act, go, acting. Yeah, we go, well, you told us to beat him up, so we beat him up. We just did what we said, we were told. And well, the, whole, the whole thing, the whole thing with the Ewoks was there were only a number of guys that were, have been in the, films, in, in the films before. But most of them had never been in a movie. And so they, they were told, like, beat them up. So they were beating us up. That, that's what happened, for real. Because they didn't know how, how to not, how to pretend beating somebody up. They had no idea. Right, right, right. What, we had, what we had was prop, like uh, balsa wood uh, props. And so I remember I was hitting you. It was one of the first days. I was hitting you, Julius. And I'm, I've got a balsa wood club, and I'm just pretending to hit you. And you look at me, and you go, and they're like, the director's mad because you're not reacting. So it's like, and the director says, cut, and he says, look, you gotta, and you look at me and you go, look, I got this plastic on. You gotta hit me hard. This is just a very light club. You gotta hit me hard. I can't feel it, so hit me hard with that. Well, meanwhile, the prop guy goes, oh, they're not even hitting them. So maybe I should just give them a real club. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And so I reach out for my prop, and he gives me a real club. By word of Julius, Julius says, hit him hard. So come, here comes action. I hit Julius hard. Julius goes down. Julius don't, down goes Julius. <laughs> Julius, he says, cut, that was great. Julius going, what the heck just happened? You know, I couldn't react, and now I could. Well, the, well, the scene where you hit us on the log, we're running along the log, and one of the stunt, uh, stunt guys got hurt. So they shipped him off, and they brought a guy in by the name of Teddy Grossman. He's the guy in the picture you were asking me about, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. So we're running across the, the log, and Teddy's like, well, what's going to happen? I said, you'll see. 
<laughs> he says, well, he says, well, uh, I, you know, I'm new at the, what can I expect? I said, Teddy, we just run across the log and everything else will be automatic. What do you mean automatic? <laughs> just run across the freaking log, man, okay? <laughs> so anyway, they call action. I ran across. And I and uh, you hit me, you hit yeah, me. Yeah, I hit you with the. Oh, is that the swinging when it comes swinging in on you and knock you off? You knocked me off the the log. But somebody came and swung. And Teddy was running. It was two people left: Larry Holt and Teddy Grossman. Somebody hit <laughs> hit Teddy, and he flew about 14 feet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's laying down. He couldn't move. He was laying down with his head, you know, his, head, his legs up in the air. His helmet was off, and and he said. Nobody told me that was going to happen. <laughs> but anyway, um, that was very typical. And, and the thing is, uh, those uh, stormtrooper outfits, they were cheap. They, you know, they were not sophisticated. And, and the one thing that they, the, the, a lot of Ewoks got wise to is when they hit us in the head, it'd ring our bell. And, and that was, you know, I mean, that's what we signed up for. But the headshot. The headshot. And then, like I said, they had, like, WWF moves. You couldn't see them because there was a lot of ferns there. And, and the guy would hide down low. Furnace gigantus. And then one would hit you in the stomach, and then you go over, and then the club comes and, and straightens you out, and, and you're down for the count. And then while you're down, you think that's it. Then it's just, uh, just a barrage of, of, of uh, punches and kicks and, and everything. But... Um, Remember the, at the rap party, we made that snake, and everybody, it was like, uh, you know, we're celib we, all, we became all friends after, at the end of the show, but uh, Dickie, you can tell them about the English dynamic. Uh, Which one? Remember, we were supposed to hate each other, because you guys came from England, and we were Americans, and oh, the coordinators yeah, weren't speaking. Oh, no, I mean, there was competition going on. The, the American stunt people were against the, the English stunt people. And um, it was it was not not a fun situation. Let's put it that way. There was a lot of competition going on because the English thought they were better than the Americans, and the Americans thought they were better than the English, and was all that going on. I start tried to stay out of all that because I had other things to do. And um, but yeah, no, it, it was a fun <laughs> it was a fun movie to do anyway. I loved it. I loved hanging around the English stuntmen because they had great stories. Like Dickie's telling me stories today. I hung around you guys all the time. <laughs> and then the uh, American stuntmen said, why, why are you hanging around those guys? You, you're supposed to be over here with us. But the way I looked at it, we were all there for the same purpose. But the, the, the two stunt coordinators, they didn't like each other. And we we're all trying to walk that fine line. But we, you know, stuntmen, we were there doing the same thing, and, and we got along fine. You know, we really respected each other, cared for each other, and um, and in the case of the, the battles with the Ewoks, I mean, I felt bad because money is the driver of m most things. And when you, you fly all that distance and they tell you you're going to make peanuts, I'd have been clubbing a few people too, you know. All right, we're going to, uh, in a couple minutes, we're going to open up the... Um the audience for questions, but have you noticed that if you've been to a couple panels, we've been giving away something every single panel. And this year, this this panel, I have the discretion of giving this out. To, this is the best one we've had so far, so I'm going to give this to myself. And no, I'm kidding. I'm going to give this to the person who asked the best question. So keep that in mind if you guys want to ask some questions. And while you're thinking of that, I'm going to ask a couple more. But we are going to open it in a few minutes. Don't we have somebody with a mic somewhere? And uh, he has no mic. We'll work it out then. So um, we'll work it out. So uh, what do you guys? This is this. I'll open this to anybody. Do you guys have a specific part of Star Wars you really you really like? Looking back, maybe it's something you did, or maybe it's a scene you saw. And I know I know Mr. Morton over there on the end is always good for a question. Right when I ask you when you're falling in, anyway. <laughs> but any, anybody has a, a favorite part of Star Wars they'd like to mention or talk about? If not, I'm gonna I'm gonna call one of the students out. I gotta say one thing real quick, and you guys saw Return of the Jedi. All right. You saw all the, uh, the the space bike stuff through the forest, and and I, I was I said, how are they gonna shoot this stuff? It was just a guy running through with a camera, and they and they they undercranked it or whatever. Oh, you know more about that than I. I'm sitting next to the guy. Uh, <coughs> we called the guy that's the 
that invented the Steadicam. He's running it. Um, it uh, wasn't steady enough because we're going to have to shoot this thing at about two or three frames a second because he's going to have to walk through that forest and it's going to have to be really fast for those things to work. So we bought a couple of the Army surplus uh, binoculars that they use on boats that have uh, a uh, gyroscope on them. We put one east and west and one north and south, <coughs> put it on his camera. He could he'd take his hand off it. He said, it's, it's, it's not moving. So now he can't move it up and down without fighting the gyroscopic action of resistance. If you look at the movie, even today, you'll see a little yellow string running around there on the ground where he's walking. Uh, oh, by the way, those things run at 400 hertz, 60 hertz out of a wall jacket, wall jack, but those are 400 hertz units. We took one out by one of the electronics gates, plugging it into that, come running to me and said, how come this happens? I said, well, it's 400 hertz because it's military stuff. He said, oh, well, what are we going to do? I said, convert it to DC and cut it back to 400 hertz, you dummy. Go, bye. I'm busy blowing <laughs> it up. <laughs> 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 but that's how it worked. And, yeah, he just walked slowly through there. That was Mr. Brown. All right. Do we have any uh, any questions from the audience? Where's my microphone guy? <coughs> hey, staff. You. I know. I mean, he's got. Someone's got to run it. Run, run, run. You're skinny. You're young. Let's go. Let's go. So by the time Return of the Jedi started filming, Star Wars was massive, and there were people who would like specifically try to find the filming location so they could watch you guys and then they'd spread the word and more people would come and come and watch did that ever happen when you were filming where they kind of got in the way or you had to tell them to leave or did you like having them like off in the distance just watching you guys with binoculars and through the fences and things like that well when when we were when we were in uh, yuma arizona there was actually pictures online that you can find out where you see the, the set in the background, and in the foreground, you see all these, um, like, uh, dune buggies, motorcycles. Actually, they came with RVs parked down there to watch, watch what the, we were doing. And that was all happening in the background. But every now and then, when the camera was looking that way, they had to clear all those people out of the way. And that was quite a job to get rid of the people <laughs> that we, you know, were in, in the shot. Because it was officially, uh, originally it was supposed to be a 360 degree um, location. So they, they cleared all the, the, the vegetation out of the way and because it had to be the white dunes, that's it. And um, so, yeah, I mean, they were there. And the only one that we didn't see many of them was in uh, the Redwood Forest because that's private property. That, uh, so they couldn't get in there. And they were, uh, yeah, a lot of local extras were playing extra uh, rebels or re uh, extra empire like stormtroopers. You have to remember too, if we didn't know it was Star Wars, how would anybody else know? But these were just people watching a movie shoot in the middle of the desert for the most part. Well, the, well that's not quite true because uh, the first and the second one were already out. So it was already known as like Star Wars uh, uh, sequel, you know. When they were when they were filming the Phantom Menace in the '90s, I was living in Germany, and I tried to get leave to get down to Africa so I could watch them film it. So you, you do find these things out. But back then, there was uh, there was the internet, so it was easy to find. But I guess some fans could figure it out. Yeah. But all right, you're in the running. So what's the next question? What do you got? Uh, got right there in the front row. Uh, First, I want to say thank you, guys. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of celebrations and things like that, and we get to see the big three talk. And But you guys really bring the movie to life. Like, all the stuff I've heard over this weekend has been absolutely amazing. Um, do you guys have, like, a favorite story about, you know, you guys seem like you really care about, like, Carrie. I had Alan Austin 
you know, he tells some funny stories about uh, Carrie Fisher or, you know, anything like, like pranks and things like that that you guys did to each other? Because <laughs> Alan told me right, a few. Wait, 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 wait. I heard a, I heard a laugh there. Was, were there some pranks done on the set? Uh, uh, <laughs> let me think about this one. <laughs> It's actually a really nice one. Carrie did have her demons, which a lot of our friends and relatives do have. And I had worked with Under the Rainbow with Carrie before. And then when I got uh, in in uh, England at uh, Elshie Studios, I I was doing costume fittings over there. I did, I saw Carrie and Carrie remembered me from Under the Rainbow. We hugged and she remembered the other stunt guys were there. And she was doing the scene with um, with Mark about finding out that she's brother and sister with them. And she was very, just having a fun time, much like, uh, who's the swashbuckler um, of the 20s? Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn, much like Errol Flynn. She's joking around with all the crew and having a fun time and thinking, is she inebriated or is she not? Is she just having fun? And then it goes right to cut and she goes right in and she's like, Luke, what do you mean? What do you mean? I can never be your sister. I can never be. I don't have those things. She never missed it. It was a long scene. It's a very long, it's like a six minute scene. She never missed a uh, cut. There was no reason to cut because of her, but she was just having the fun behind the scenes. But when it came to the meat of the scene and the, and the work, she was on. So that's, that was really something to re remember Carrie about. Nice. Nice. Yeah. That was a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So next question, over there. Um, so I have a couple of co quick comments and then a question for David. Um, first off, Kevin and Tracy, your book was awesome. I loved it. I read it on a flight to Hawaii for Thank a business you. trip. And on the way back from that same trip, I could not sleep. I'd seen every movie on the American Airlines app, so I just read it again. And shout out to you on that. That was a great book. And also to everyone else out here. Uh, that book um, is for sale, by the way, yes, at Kevin's table. Go to his booth, get it. So, um, and then Mr. Morris, I was talking to you earlier, and uh, I was telling you, I found your uh, Thursdays with Thane on YouTube. I highly recommend for everyone to go watch that. It's very quick episodes, there's probably, what, 10, 12 of them? Thursday with Thane? Thursdays with Thane, and he basically tells <clears throat> his, you know, story. And uh, Is there, a are there a lot of components of Star Wars in that story? About everything I worked on. Everything you worked on. Okay, and that sounds interesting. He was also involved with a one of the best Christmas movies of all time that came out in 1988, 89. No spoilers, but I think you can figure out what I'm talking about. Wow. You know. The stuff um, blew up there, too. What's that? The stuff blew up in that movie, too, the one he's talking about. Yeah. Uh, because of Empire and uh, Jedi, I become known as the guy that could blow stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm an effects guy. Okay. Uh, if it's impossible, dangerous, or stupid, the director comes looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, and... Uh, I went from Jedi down to Los Angeles and went to work for Boss Film. Uh, Richard Edlund was the lead there. Richard was one of the lead cameramen on uh, Empire and Jedi. And uh, we opened uh, that up with Ghostbusters in 2010. He lied to me. He said he had a big movie called 2010 and Ghostbusters, which is just a little movie. 2010 is the prettiest movie I ever worked on, but it certainly wasn't the best. <laughs> did you have a question? Yeah, there? a question for David. Uh, did yeah. you have Fantastic. any any clue that you were ever going to get called back for Rogue One? Did you? No, like, did, did, no, did no. Just get a call out of no, the blue it was one day. Like 40 years later, I was living in Kansas City, um, and I got a, a Facebook um, message from uh, Matthew Wood. And I said, yeah, are you interested in an SW project? And I, you know, let me check my calendar. And it was clear. Uh, yeah, so I said, uh, <laughs> I, 
Yeah, I didn't even have a calendar then. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, they flew me uh, to Disney. Stu I mean, it was such a different experience than the, the very first one I did with just a little uh, ADR uh, recording studio in Hollywood with George, which was pretty special. But at the time, I didn't know it was that special. It was, you know, an afternoon's work as an actor. But this one was so different, you know. It was, uh, and talking about sec secrecy, so we get to this huge soundstage at Disney, and outside it's, and I wish I could remember the name, it was not Rogue One. Um, somebody might know, but I, it was not that, and I can't remember the name of it. Uh, Blue Harvest 2. <laughs> 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 That's it, yes, Red Harvest. And um, so you go in and it's just, uh, I, I, I tell you, I, I got goosebumps because one of my lines was, may the force be with you. And I, and I was, by that time I was a huge fan, you know, and, uh, and the, the, there was about 40 uh, voice actors there, uh, all uh, Kane and all these great voice voice over actors. And uh, I really wasn't a voice actor. I was an actor. You know, I did a series and a lot of guest star stuff on, on shows. And uh, but I, you know, I, I just had I had a lot of fun, and I was, it was so special to to say those lines. And and one of the things is. Did my job, I think it went well. Got back to Kansas City, and I got a I got a call from Matthew saying, "Well, we made a mistake. Uh, Wedge hadn't seen the Death Star before, and the, and in the lines they gave me, there was indications that I, I had seen it, um, or Wedge had seen it. So we had to record. I had to record it in Kansas City, uh, in a little recording studio, and uh, get it back to them, but." That I mean, for, for me, that was a, a pretty emotional experience. I Man, I, I got goosebumps. I, you know, and I, I went to see it. I, I totally forgot to listen to my lines because Rogue One. I really loved Rogue One. I, th I thought it was really, really amazing film. Um, I, tr I tried to look it up. I couldn't see what Rogue One's uh, working title was. Does anybody here know in the audience? Do you have any good, good? Is it really? It was it really called that? Or are you just being funny? Oh, it was okay. Project Stardust. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna look that up. You better be telling the truth. Yeah, because it was it was out on the uh, outside and uh, and they wouldn't show us. I mean, we got to see some sequences uh, on this huge screen in in the, in the studio. Um, and they they allowed us to see Vader's entrance. You know, just just his entrance, and they stopped it and they wouldn't show us anymore. So you got an indication of kind of what that film is going to be like. Uh, That's great, though. Yeah, yeah. Do we have another question? Um, well, got many. we'll get you in a second. Um, just a show of hands. How many of you have action figures of yourselves? Does anybody have an action figure? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> and do you display them? Does a Lego action count? Figure, Does a Lego action count? Action figure of yourself? You have Julius, you don't have a Weequay or, or a Gamorrean or anything like that? Or a Lando, no? <laughs> okay. Right. Who else? Uh, Tom, uh, Kevin, you raised your hand, right? John, I... Oh, sorry. I have a Kmart... Uh, what's it called? It's the catapult. That's where I was named. I didn't <laughs> find out that I was named until a fan came with the catapult to my <laughs> autograph table at Celebration. At, at Celebration. And I'm looking at it going, that's me. And he goes, yeah, I know. That's why I'm bringing it to you to sign. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I found out I was named. That's funny. Yeah. Now, John, I know you must have a figure of either Boba Fett or Deck. Um, yeah, I've got uh, several in various forms. Um, the first one somebody gave me was um, a small, it was a, um, uh, a figure that was in one of the s snow speeders um, about two decades ago. And then, then I discovered, usually they, they were, in fact, in all cases, they were given to me. Uh, then there was the Legos, Lego DAC. And then, um, then there were um, counterfeit um, uh, action figures that I actually got here at Plano when I did Ben Stevens, uh, one of his first, when I was with Mike Carter. And what they were was, um, this is kind of interesting, is history, uh, you know, fans and collectors. Um, in those days, and this was 1997, I think, 
Um, they had all sorts of counterfeit. Was it Kenner or Hasbro that was doing the action figures? We all Kenner. Kenner, Kenner. Kenner started it, and by the late '90s, it was it was Hasbro. But, but well, I think it, I think it was Kenner. And I got I bought or no, I was given two counterfeit ones by one of the dealers that was here um, to give one each to my daughters. And what they were was they were they were Luke Skywalker action figures that the counterfeiters would take the back off and manufacture on one side DAC with my picture and all this kind of stuff, you know. Um, and it would be a DAC action figure. And how you knew it was counterfeit, you'd turn it over and it was just cardboard, right? Yeah. Didn't have this. So that, you know, that was one. Well, eventually, Kenner, I guess Hasbro, decided to have action figures for all of us. So you had uh, Wedge and you had um, uh, Zev and um, Porkins and DAC and so forth, I believe. Um, then there, about two years ago, there was a black series that was quite interesting. It came out where it was the uh, Snowspeeder and DAC. And the DAC figure is about nine inches and what have you. That's uncanny because instead of having this sort of the basic generic rebel pilot face, uh, it's, it's John Morton. And how I know this is what, when it, uh, they sent me one to uh, uh, advertise and take a picture with. Um, I opened it up and you know was looking at it, and my wife said, "Hey, that's you." <laughs> so um, what I did was um, I do Facebook now. I don't I don't do um, um, Twitter anymore or X. Um, I, I I very carefully crafted a shot. Um, outdoors on our deck of this action figure uh, and had, you know, after a while I got it so that the eyes of the action figure are looking right at the camera. And um, I, I captured it and I posted it and I said, hey, here's an image of, you know, what I used to look like. And nobody realized, you know, with the comments, oh, that's a great shot. And then I revealed that, oh, no, this is a piece of plastic. So. <laughs> You know, it was very interesting. So yeah, I don't want to go in any further, but there's, you know, s the <laughs> and but to the important point you asked, Kevin, uh, is all right. You do. Does anybody here have an action figure of themselves, and do you exhibit it? And I can very definitely say the answer is no. <laughs> That's <laughs> all wrong. in storage. All right, we had a question here in the front row. Better be a good one because you're going to get a good prize if you. Uh, so my question is, is did any of y'all uh, take anything from the set or maybe tried to take something and they're like, no? Yes, but I can't tell you. <laughs> no, 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 D Dave. Dickie, Dickie. <laughs> Don't leave it like that. I'll, I'll, I'll have him turn the camera off and we'll shut the doors. I was about to say, that was for everybody. And, and also there's probably a statute of limitations because it's been 40 years. It's a, actually, it's a follow-up from my story that started, you know, when I ended up sleeping on set. When I went to the hotel and I had the helmet with me, I kept it in the hotel, never took it back to the set. So that one went with me when I went home. Oh, nice. yeah. Here's a follow-up question. Where's the helmet now? It's been sold in an auction. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. um, a couple of years ago, yeah, paid my mortgage. I, was, I won't. I won't even ask. <laughs> That's pretty good. Do we have uh, another question from the audience? You already asked one. You don't get another one. It's not for me. It's I should see where it's at. Oh, I got you. I'm sure. <laughs> you could be the voice of her. You just pull through the mirror. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> when you guys initially worked on Star Wars, did you ever think of how? like big the franchise would become, like how many people it would, would touch? No clue. No. We had no idea that had it was. No idea 40 years later. <laughs> All right, so the, uh, the lady right here, come on, I want you to do it. You can do it. Uh, Don't be nervous. You can, you can do, do it. it. Uh, I'm such an introvert. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to know, what was like the biggest takeaway working on these films? Like what was the biggest lesson that you learned while working on the films? Well, that's a good question. The biggest? What did you What did you learn to working on the films? Would you? Well, at, at the time, I, c I can say that uh, prior to that, 
there was nothing as big in Hollywood being done. And um, for me, I, I learned to collaborate better, to, to work more as a team, um, to trust uh, the people in charge, Richard Marquand and everybody, and George Lucas, everybody had designed these fabulous things that we had never seen before. I had to learn to trust. Like I said, there were creatures that weren't there that we couldn't see, and we had to pretend they were there. And um, it was just uh, really a film of trust, uh, the work that you did. Uh, everybody, this visual effects, special effects, everybody did something that was really unique for the time. And it was just, I thought it was going to be the corniest movie ever made. I really did, and and to look at it is just amazing. And we were talking about today the vision that George Lucas had. You you can tell that the newer Star Wars, they don't measure up to these. You know they don't. To be honest, they don't. They're okay, but they're not like the first three. Here, here, I completely agree with that. <laughs> Applaud. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> so cool with it. Uh, so that was a good question. You did a good job. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Uh, it's right behind you. Can well, while are you wait, can I add a little piece to that? John, you can say whatever you want, man. Um, Anything. You know, I'm I'm an old guy. I'm 77, and so in the 70s, I was still a hippie. And um, with a ponytail? Uh, not in the early 70s. Yeah, yeah. That that ponytail went when I did a job in France, and I wanted to get it in the country. Because you have said, a ponytail now, you know they, that, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah they, so. said, they said, uh, if you're a long hair, you're going to get busted going across the border, so you better get your hair cut, which I did, to my regret. But anyway, getting back to um, what I wanted to say. In those days, uh, there was a book that was around uh, called Small is Beautiful. And all of us hippies or post-hippies or whatever I could identify with in those days, um, had this notion that small is beautiful, and so therefore small films and small productions had more honesty. And you know, quite frankly, I was influenced by, you know, um, uh, Taxi Driver and uh, you know those sorts of films. And so when I was booked to do Star Wars, um, Star Wars was a huge film. At least the second one, Empire Strikes Back, was not a small film with a huge budget, huge cast, huge um, whatevers. And so kind of like what you're saying, Julius, is that I kind of went into this thing thinking, oh, this is, you know, this is Hollywood, this isn't art. And I very quickly realized that the spirit of the film that uh, George and um, Gary Kurtz in particular uh, brought to the, to the production carried all the way down from the top down to the tea lady and uh, I came away instantaneously with, I think, the kind of thing you're talking about, Julius, where I, I would say to people, oh, not only s small is beautiful. Um, th it was a great experience. The morale was so high and what have you, at least with Empire Strikes Back, which is all I can talk about. You guys have different experiences. But it really was um, a magical, spirit-filled, force-filled experience for me which I think carries over today, which has a lot to do with kind of what you're saying, Kevin. It's, you know, there was some honesty that was in there, whatever we say about commercialism, that carries over to why you're here. I mean, we and the fans are all part of this amazing experience. Anyway, so yeah, not only small is beautiful. That's, that was my lesson. We, we have time for one more question. A uh, question for those that were uh, involved with the Sarlacc uh, pit scenes from Jedi. Um, seen a lot of photos online from behind the scenes shots that show a bunch of speeder bikes from Endor that were actually at the Sarlacc pit, but yet I've never seen anything from a script or scenes that were ever shot, but I don't know if anybody had any insight into what those were doing out there. I, I've never seen, so you're saying you saw pictures of speeder bikes speeder that were bikes later was, used in the movie for Endor, the Endor scenes. Yeah. They were in pictures that were on the desert scenes. Of, yes. yes. So any chance they had them there just for you guys to practice what it was like to sit on them or something? No, they were never there. Not oh. as far as I know. Interesting. Did they film 
the Sarlacc pit scenes first and then move you guys up immediately to floor? So maybe it was a shipping thing? Yes. yes. Yeah. What, what it was is, um, you ever see the Road Runner and uh, Wile E. Coyote? Quite it was, it was kind of like that. I mean, I did a stunt in the forest, and Dickie did one where you saw he got catapulted into a tree. Well, I was on the end of the catapult the with Dickie swing. on it. Russian, Russian swing. And a Russian swing. Never been done before. And, you know, this, these were all new stunts. And, and, and th those bikes were, this was the end result of what you saw after the work you did through the forest. Uh, Dickie hit the tree, and then I hit the log that, you know, I, I rolled over on the log, and I was on this big thing that looked like a roller coaster. And the stunt coordinator back then, you couldn't refuse anything or you wouldn't work anymore. So I got on this thing. It had wheels. It was on a rail. And I was going down, and, you know, did you see the, the whole stunt, Dickie? It was a pretty good clip, and it wasn't very well designed because the way you got off of the thing, it was a big redwood tree that was on the ground. You had to time it to where you had to clear the redwood tree and if you st stuck in there, you're gonna get hurt real bad. So it was just things like that it was being, Kevin, the, the stunts that you guys did, these was like, seemed they were kind, we didn't have a lot of rehearsal time. No rehearsal. No, no, rehearsal. Uh, no rehearsal time. We just, it was like this is the scene, and Dave Tomlin, who was the first AD on the movie, he explained to everybody where they had to be and what was going to happen, and that was it. They rolled the camera and do it. That, that's, the way, that's the way we did it. So I think the answer to your question is no, you're wrong. <laughs> there was no. But I, I wonder if they were shipping the stuff all together, maybe they just had a couple of pieces of equipment. That, that's a, that's a possibility there. that they actually had mystery. the props yeah. with us or they were still working on it, but I don't remember seeing that. Do you know one thing that they do, and I know they did this with movies in the prequels, is that they'd be working on one scene and they have another scene, it's months down, weeks down the road to be filmed. They'd bring something for George to look at to say, yeah, that works or not. Yeah, that'll work, we'll do that's that. That's a possibility, yeah. yes, but yeah. as I say, I don't remember seeing yeah. that, no. Well, all right, so... Uh, so All right, we'll see this. this Andy, would you know anything about speeder bikes from the Return of the Jedi scenes that were actually in where they were filming the outside uh, Jabba's uh, sail barge scene? Not on the sail barge scene, I don't know. We had speeder bikes at ILM that we had to modify so we could put them on a uh, crane mm -hmm. and slam them together for the, the uh, chase scene. And it was all shot in front of a blue screen. Okay. And it was about two days shooting with that. And uh, we had to come up with a way to take a thing called a tulip crane. Uh, it was designed to put in the back of a pickup truck, take two of them and uh, put the speeder bikes on them and figure out how we could turn them round and round so that we could control them, it ended up with uh, the front wheel hubs off of AMC cars, which you can buy cheap, and uh, a rope wrapped around a brake drum so that we could control it from the back. I mean, it was, you know, like I said, if it's stupid, crazy, or dangerous, that's what we're going to do. Any chance the, the cranes that you used for the speeder bikes, were they the same cranes that were used during the scenes for Jabba's sail barge? No. Okay. I was thinking maybe they, were, they all shift together or something like that. But those, those cranes are uh, camera cranes. The, okay. The okay. sail barge one time when they wanted me to blow that up, and I told them that it would look like, well, we can't say it in front of public. Uh, I get you. <laughs> and... Uh, that was when we had to go back and make the miniature to make it work. Okay. That thing was a pole barn with, covered with plywood, basically. Yeah. And try to blow that up? Uh-uh. No, 
good, very good. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. This was, I, I didn't know the battle between the Ewoks and the Stormtroopers were real, how, how, the, how intense it was. This was a great panel. But we have one more job we have to do before we go. We have to find out who wins this thing. So I've narrowed it down to two questions that were asked by our wonderful audience. Somebody asked about favorite stories and pranks, and Kevin gave a great answer with Carrie. So that's, that's in the running. And the other one I thought was um, uh, by the little silent one who didn't want to talk. I liked your, story, your question about uh, what did you learn. And I think uh, Julius and I think uh, 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 John gave great answers. So which ones do you think should win, guys? That's the uh, favorite story, or what did you learn the most from being in Star Wars? What do you guys think should win? I think what did you learn the most? Is that a good, we're all in agreement? What did you learn? Which one asked that one? That was you, the quiet one. Look, you win a Darth Vader concept. All yours. Thank you very much. Now, I would say to go in and enjoy the rest of the show today, but actually the convention is over 8 o'clock, right? Am I right? Is it 8 o'clock? Do you have any idea what I'm talking about? Go away, Dave. Go away. Anyway, so, uh, but the convention is here tomorrow, so you can enjoy it tomorrow, and all these wonderful people will be in the autograph hall. You're all here tomorrow, right? Yeah. Fantastic. So see everybody. Whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody sit down. Sit down. So he has a picture of the speeder bikes on the set. He's right. That's the back of the katana. Who wants to see this? I don't know. We'll just pass this around. That's the back of the katana, which is Jabba's sail barge, and there's a bunch of speeder bikes. Maybe they were first thought of to be part of that scene and then scrapped and brought into... We have a mystery here. Very good, sir. You can, you can, you can keep that phone. You can keep that phone. Go back again. I, you go get as I said, I've okay. never seen those, but I reckon that they took them there to show them to the director, and they, they had to approve the final looks okay. of it you know that's right. what i reckon it was and then they must have been shipped to the location in uh, north north california okay that makes me good that's oh we're, we're still gonna go on this all right well, one more thing that was very important all of this stuff was secrecy oh yeah and, and one of the other the most important things was the toys the kenner toys and hasbro they didn't want anybody taking any pictures of anything so that somebody can go and make it and put it out before the show was released that, that's so because sure, what uh, that, sure that happened that. On, on the first Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. And Lucas stopped that by, you know, stopped like people making toys uh, without paying for it. <laughs> that's basically what it was, you know. And uh, that's why on all the other films, and even now it's still going on, it's like you have to sh shut your mouth and don't make any pictures. It just happened actually on a new... Uh, Star Wars TV series, uh, TV episode that comes out now. Uh, one of the mothers of one of the children that was on that movie. Be careful, she's here. Yeah, she's one of the mothers that was on that movie made a picture of her child on set and put, and I think it was either a picture or a video, but I'm not sure, but ended up on Facebook, on, uh, on the internet. That scene is now taken out of the movie. Because of that. Right, like I said, it's after 8 o'clock, so we got to kind of go. But you guys are all going to be tomorrow. And if you want, uh, you guys can come down and meet them. Thank you very much. Thank you.